So we're looking at Philippians 2, 12, comma, 2, uh, 13. I like to put a dash there. Well, okay, let's put a dash. Okay, 12, 13. And uh, therefore, my beloved, as you have already obeyed, always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in, your both, in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And we're moving on down to that passage where Zane Hodges, in his usual very thorough way, says the same idea is present in the Apostle Peter's famous passage on suffering found in 1 Peter 1, 6-9. The expression in verse 9, which is translated, the salvation of your souls, would be much better translated according to its normal Greek sense, the salvation of your lives. There you go. Let's see, 1 Peter 1, 6 to 9. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. see quite there's Peter 1 6 to 9 was that it yeah yeah this idea the same idea is present in what I just read in the Apostle Peter's famous passage on suffering found in 1 Peter 1 6 to 9 the expression in verse 9 which is translation translated the salvation of your soul Oh, okay. Continuing. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Up oh, There it is. And obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The outcome of your faith. The outcome of your faithfulness is the idea here. The salvation of your souls. Not the salvation unto eternal life there, but the, the preservation of the value of your life for eternal rewards. Deliverance. Okay, I got you. That would be much better translated according to his normal Greek sense, the salvation of your lives. <clears throat> Peter is describing the messianic experience in which the believer partakes of Christ's sufferings first in order that he might subsequently share the glory to which those sufferings lead. 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. In this way, in this way, the life is saved even when paradoxically it is lost because it results in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, Mr. Hodges goes on to say, in fact, it can be said that there is not a single place in the New Testament where the expression to save the soul ever means final salvation from hell. It cannot be shown that any native Greek speaker would have understood this expression in any other way than the idiomatic way. That is, he would understand it as signifying to save the life in the sense of preserving or, or saving the value of one's temporal life for eternal rewards. In modern use, of course, to save the soul is almost universally understood as a reference to eternal salvation. But this fixit, fixity in its meaning is not relevant to its New Testament use. In the New Testament, we should always understand it as equal to our expression to save the life. In Philippians, Paul never uses the word salvation to refer to the question of heaven or hell. After all, both he and his readers knew where they were going. Their names were in the book of life. Philippians 4, 3. Let's take a look at that. Philippians 4, 3. 
Indeed, true companion. I ask you also, Paul says to the Philippian individuals in the Philippian church, to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. If your name is in the book of life, it's, it talks about the permanence of your salvation if you're in the book of life, right? Now, everybody's name in the book of life, so it would be kind of redundant to say, well, yeah, it could be erased later on. Well, why would he even say that then? Romans 2, 7, 10, and 13. It is a tragic feature of the modern debate over salvation that certain statements made by Paul in his great epistle to the church in Rome have been turned upside down. These statements are found in Romans 2 and are intended by the apostle to undermine man's hopeless state before the bar of God's judgment. Instead, some modern theologians take them as proof texts that good works, as the fruit of faith, will be the final test of a person's salvation. Let us look at the Pauline statements in question. Who will render to every man according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. It is certainly astounding that these words would be could be taken in such a way as to nullify the doctrine Paul goes on to teach in this epistle, when he writes emphatically, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 this tragic confusion could have easily been avoided. In Romans 2, Paul is discussing how God will deal with men in the final judgment, Romans 2, 5. One should remember that born-again believers do not come into that judgment. At the judgment bar of God, the day of grace will be passed, and men will stand before their judge for his final assessment of their lives. His judgment will be impartial and based on their works. Those who have persevered in doing good may expect eternal life. Those who have not only heard but kept God's law will receive God's justification. But who are these? There are none. Romans 3.20 says so plainly. Romans 3.20 Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Obeying the law won't get you salvation. The standpoint in Romans 2 is analogous, analogous to a judge who has a line of defendants ranged before his tribunal. Speaking in the non-prejudicial language of the law courts, he might say to them, In this courtroom, everyone will get exactly what he deserves. The innocent will be cleared, but the guilty will be condemned to punishment. Does this statement imply that some of the defendants are innocent and will be cleared? Of course not. The judge is simply stating the principles which will obtain in this court. Justice and equity will be the hallmark of this judicial proceeding. Romans 2, 7, 10, and 13 are not spoken as a prediction as though there actually will be people whose works entitle them to eternal life and justification. Instead, these verses state the principles on which the judgment which judgment will be based in God's final assessment of lost men. Each person will get what he deserves. But Paul's doctrine was that no one would gain eternal salvation on the basis of principles like these. In the very next chapter on this epistle, Romans 3, Paul will demonstrate that very point. Precisely then, because men fail to pers persevere in good works or truly to do God's law, they are utterly shut up to the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 3, 21 to 26. Other Pauline texts. Within the limited scope of this book, it is not possible to touch every single passage which at one time or another has been used to prove that Paul treated good works as an inevitable outcome of true regeneration. Paul simply did not hold such a view of works, though no writer insists more strongly than he that Christians ought to do them. Unfortunately, let's just take a look. 
I love this passage. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that salvation is not of yourselves, it's neuter. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can, may boast. Period. Now. For, because. Now you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So now you've got that scenario. Now it's now there's further explanation, for we are his workmanship, now that we've been saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast, right? Created in Christ Jesus at this point, that you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That comes after salvation by grace through faith. You have been saved, perfect tense, at the point in time with ongoing present results forever. There you go. So, unfortunately, the, the apostle has now always been credited with being truly consistent with his fundamental insistence that works have nothing to do with determining a Christian's basic relationship to God. Right, we just quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9. That relationship in Pauline thought is founded on pure grace and nothing else. Often, Paul's statements are treated in a very one-dimensional way. Even though very, every epistle he wrote is addressed to those who have already come to saving faith, his teachings are frequently taken as though he was constantly concerned about the eternal destiny of his readers. But there was no reason why he should have been. His many direct declarations that his audiences have experienced God's grace show that he was not concerned about this. Such declarations abound in the Pauline letters. And Ephesians 2, which we just read, and Titus 3 are merely two of the most notable. Simply, sta simple statements like, <clears throat> for you were bought at a price, there, thereby, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Show exactly what he thought about his rela reader's relationship to God. There is not even a single place in the Pauline letters where he clearly expresses doubt that his audience is composed of true Christians. Romans 8, 14. So when the apostle writes, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, Romans 8, 14. He is not offering a test by which his readers may decide if they are saved or not. His readers possess a faith which is spoken of throughout the whole world, Romans 1, 8. They enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as access by faith into this grace in which we stand, Romans 5, 1 and 2. Note the repeated use of we. That we could conceivably be unregenerate is the farthest thought from the apostle's mind. But for Paul, the concept of being a son of God involved more than being regenerate. As he makes clear in Galatians 4, 1 to 7, a son is one who has been granted adult status, in contrast to the child who is under guardians and stewards, Galatians 4, 1 and 2. This, of course, means that the Christian, as a son, is free from the law. Thus, the statement of Romans 8, 14 is identical in force to that of Galatians 5, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The identity between the statements is confirmed also by the reference to the spirit of bondage in Romans 8.15. Consequently, both in Romans 8.14 and Galatians 5.18, Paul is talking about the way in which our freedom from the law is experientially realized. When the spirit leads the life, there is no more legal bondage. The believer enters into the freedom of real sonship to God, and that sonship becomes a reality in his day-by-day -day experience. Titus 1.16. Nor should a test of regeneration be detected in a verse like Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. It is superficial to take the word deny as though it meant nothing more than he's not a Christian. A little reflection will show that there are various ways in which a believer may deny God. He may do it verbally, as Peter did on the night of our Lord's arrest, but he may also do it morally, by a lifestyle that contradicts the implications of the truth he professes. How easily this can be done, even by a single act that clashes with our Christian profession. Every honest Christian ought to be able to know out of his own experience. Besides, the people Paul has in mind in Titus 1.16 are evidently the same as those of whom he says in verse 13, Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. <clears throat> the Greek